at Canaan in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no wine. Dear mother, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servant, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood the six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now, draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn from it knew. Then he called the bridegrooms aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheap wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you, you, you saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Canaan in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put faith in him. Let us pray. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with your glory. Holy Spirit, come. Fill our hearts, set on our hearts on fire, just like the two young men on their way to the town. As they speak with God, as they speak with the Lord Jesus, their heart was filled and burning inside of them. Lord, Holy Spirit, may you hide me behind the cross in this hour that our children, our, your children, may hear you speak today. Hide me behind the cross, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever had a day when you tell God, I am going to give it, try it one more time? Or maybe on a Sunday like this, you say to God, this is your last chance to change things. Otherwise, no more of this church thing. Have you ever had those days where you have given God a last warning or a notice on his door to change things or else? Have you ever given God an ultimatum? That sounds kind of creepy and, and kind of crazy. But am I the only one who have had that experience where I tell God, God, this is your last day, or else. Maybe like Mary, who was bold enough, who commanded the Lord Jesus to do something in this time of trouble in the middle of the wedding. Maybe you, you're you not that kind of person crazy like me. You know, my one of my pastors used to tell me that, Joy, you got a bad theology. <laughs> and I'll tell him, I say, well, um, Jesus doesn't talk theology. Jesus talks real. 
While I was sitting with Susan, I said, I want to have a conversation with you. And we were going through this text. And she started talking about, you know, the connection of the wedding between the church and being the bride. I say, Susan, back up. Let us keep it simple. Let us not do theology. Let us read this. So I want to tell you a story this morning. It is easy to read Isaiah 62 and see the blessings that God has granted his people. One can easily miss the joy and the celebration found in this text, unless he or she has encountered the Israelite story, or have experienced droughts in their lives, or felt desolated and abandoned. Then Isaiah 62 will not be a passing by scripture. You will not just read it as one of the casual readings. You see, for 70 years, the Israelites, the people of God, were held captive and far from home. There was loud weeping and wailing in town. The families were separated. Some were part of Judah. Some remained in Babylon. The Israelites felt desolated. Where is God? Their land was not producing. People were dying. God seems to be far distant, in a far distant country. Where is hope? I am sure they asked, when will this ever end? Some might have been angry with God, and others remained faithful, praying restoration. Restoration. Some encourage others to stay hopeful. They knew God is still present help. Have you ever been at the point where you give God the last notice? Where it was too hard to carry? Like the Israelite, I too have had the moment where I felt desolation. I felt abandoned. God was far to be rich, it seemed like. I had just moved to the United States, the land of opportunity. I had many dreams. I wanted to become a cardiopulmonologist. As one of the young people in my family, I was loved. My sibling can testify that one of the youngest I was spoiled and loved. <laughs> Until one day, everything crumbled. I began to ask, where is God? Like the Israelite, I too heard the voice of the prophets for hope. After years of struggling with anger, suicide, thoughts, anorexia, and harming myself, something happened. In the darkness, something happened. My late father spoke to me. He said, Joy, I cannot solve your problem. I do not have money to share or to buy you happiness. But I have one thing that I can give you. I give you God. Find a church. Seek God and serve. You know when you're a teenager and you're going through something, you do not want to have a father-daughter conversation. You want to be in your own zone and you don't want to hear what the world got because nobody understood. And my father, my late father, did not want to push it through. But he knew. Who can solve this mystery for me? To make a long story short, I began to attend a church. Not knowing what to expect or how soon I would experience a breakthrough, I grew impatient and gave God an ultimatum, <coughs> saying, this is your last chance. Lord, do something. 
Yes, I understand it is a bad theology, but when you're in a desperate time, when you are hurting, when 70 years of pain and hurt, when you are far from home, when the army is pressing, when you see people being raped, when you see your children's neighbor being killed, 70 years, yes, you will find the word to say, God, this is your last chance. Friends, change does not come unless we surrender things to God. Change does not happen unless we obey what we have been told. Change does not come unless trust, we trust in the Lord. Like the prophet who trusted God and his ability to solve the mystery. Like Mary who commanded God. Like my father who spoke words of encouragement. You see, they trusted God. They trusted that he was able to take a hard situation, a sticky and muddy issue, and transform it into an experience that's going to be so beautiful. God is able to turn wine into, to take water and turn it into wine. Mary saw the needs. The prophet saw the needs. There was a situation beyond Mary's power, her control, or her abilities. But she knew, she knew, brothers and sisters, who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly more than she can even think about. Mary did not ask Jesus for wine. She told Jesus and commanded that he does something. She knew if she surrendered the issue to the Lord, the Son of God, the solution will come. Mary told the servant, do whatever he tells you. Jesus then said to the servant, fill the jar with water. You see, this is the part of the text that gets me shivers. This is the part where Unless you understand Mary's pain, unless you understand the status of these servants, this is the part where the text becomes critical. Because, I'm going to move from here, there were jars of water beside there. Maybe it wasn't this big, it was bigger. Jesus said, take water and fill it up. They must be scared because the guests were waiting for wine. They must be scared because the wine was no longer there. What will they do now? When you are out of job and you have to feed your children, and this is the only job you have, when you're out of wine, it is scary. Then Jesus said to them, take a glass and bring it to the master. They take water. They took some out. You know, some of us will start judging first. Well, you know, the basin is not right. The, the, the things is not right. But they trusted what Lord has said. Draw some out. But you don't understand. If they find out that it's water, my job is finished. Take the cup to the master. She must have been shaking. Losing her job, where will the children eat? How will they receive their food? How would I pay tuition? How would I pay for this? And shaking, taking the glass to the master. And the master holds it. And took a wine, took a glass. That is good wine. You don't understand. The miracle is not Jesus turning the 
the water into wine. But the trust that whoever drinks, whoever is thirsty, will receive new life. Whoever is hungry will take and have, will receive new life. But you know, when you are called to the table, you start thinking, well, you know, I know that Susan made this bread. I know where they bought this juice. But when you are hurting deep inside, and you are sitting in the pew, and you are invited at the table, this is no longer bread and juice. This is salvation. This is healing for my sickness. This is redemption for my family. This is the healing that my brother needs. This is where I come to Jesus and say, I am broken. Heal me, O oh Lord. Heal me, O oh Lord. You see, my father said, go to church. I refused. I might have said no. But I went to church. <clears throat> And there they serve communion. Called me to come forward. And I said, Jesus, this is your last chance. I need healing. I need to see better. And I need you to feed me. The master was thirsty. He wanted wine. It did not matter where that came from. What came from was that he hungered for Jesus. And the moment he took the cup, what he was thirsty for, Jesus had provided. Brothers and sisters, you know where you are in the journey. Change has already come. Jesus has provided already the table. The question is, what are you going to do? Let us pray. <clears throat> Grace and mercy you have provided. Healing you have provided. Nothing is impossible to you, O God. You hear the cry of the broken, and you restore them to life. You say that you will not be still until you restore us. Your words, O oh God, in Isaiah 62, promise life. We will no longer be called desolate, but we will be called the chosen one of the Lord. Lord, may you walk with us. May you hear the brokenhearted. May you heal relationship. May you heal all that has been broken. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs>